Hi there, it's Vicki Ross, and I had a head study that I thought I'd share with you on this, uh, it's a sunny afternoon here in Arkansas. So, while I am measuring and beginning to come to grips and observe the Ilya Repin drawing that I chose to study, um, I want to invite you to subscribe and click the little bell so that um, you'll get noticed when I do new videos. I'm beginning to uh, start a new project probably next week or the week after on a field note study concept, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Oh, my Patreon site is coming up, and it will have more in-depth tutorials and some videos without ads and things like that, a little bit more than what you get. Because uh, providing free content like this does cost money, and if you enjoy it, you can chip in a few dollars to keep it coming. Um, my Facebook page is Vicki Ross Art, and you'll have to go there because I've reached the 5,000 limit on my friends on my timeline and the free Facebook group is actually art a-x-u-l-l-y and you can remember that because it's the phonetic spelling of actually so got all the business out of the way I am uh, doing this in an Arteza notebook it's a mixed media notebook and I'm using it looks like just a graphite pencil. And I'm measuring from the outside dimensions of the head and face to the inside. And that's more of a drawing concept than a painting concept. Painting concepts, usually you paint from the inside out. You paint shadows and shapes, or at least that's the way I do. There are people who do it otherwise. Um, the head shape that I'm doing here has a rounded top and then the angular bottom, triangular bottom of the chin. So it's two shapes in one here. It's the circle that you start with where um, the head down, the top of the head down to the eyes is half and then eyes to the chin is half. So half circle on top and then draw the angular part underneath it kind of a polygon or a triangle shape so that all that does is it helps you as an artist get into the details of what you're drawing get familiar with how this particular pose and this particular head is presented to you um, if the head is tilted back the uh, space between the top of the head and the eyes will be less. If it's tilted forward, you're going to get more of the top of the head to the eyes and less of the bottom half. If it's tilted to the side or turned to the side, it affects every measurement except one. And that measurement is the space between the eyes. A line, imagine a line between the eyes and it follows the uh, tilt of the head. So this, this line might be 45, 17 degrees turned either way. So you draw a straight line, let's just say from iris to iris, the black part of the eye. Then perpendicular to that eye, you find the nose. And those that intersection never changes. It's the spacing on either side of the eye or up and down that changes. So if you'll start with your plus sign, it will help you identify uh, the face that you're drawing. I remember the first time I was told that. Um, and the, the uh, tutor that I had was, he held up a paintbrush and a pencil into a plus sign. And, he's, and then he turned those two items as he was demonstrating that the plus sign never moved. It never changed. 
and that stuck with me so maybe that will stick with you too The other given, more or less, it's a, um, it's almost always true in the ideal phase. And the ideal phase is based on mathematical calculations from the days of Greek architecture. And I won't go into detail here. I'll, I've done it before, but you can pretty well bank on the fact that the width of an eye is measure the eye from corner to corner. And then you have one, that's your point of measurement, okay? The head is five eyes across unless it's tilted or turned. So if it's looking straight at you, there are five eyes across. And then that means one eye on the side of the head where the temple is, one eye for an eye, and one eye between eyes, eye, and then temple. So there are your your basic starting point. So in the very beginning, I usually try to set the eyes where they're going to be and I measure everything else from there. So in other words, I know where the forehead or the eyebrows are going to be in relation to the eye. And from the forehead, I can measure two eyes down and pretty well have the length of the nose. Now again, this changes if the head is tilted. Those are, um, those are things that can change the measurement, particularly with the nose and the eyes. I mean, with the nose. Um, and then from there, you can pretty well build your face. But every time you measure, get your eye measurement and then measure down on your uh, source photo. And you can then transfer that to your paper. Try not to get too detailed in the beginning. so that you're not committed. Do some scratchy type drawing and um, don't erase so that your beginning lines still show. It's always fun as an artist to be able to look at one of the old masters uh, drawings from start to finish or a painting where they never finished it and you get to see what they did on the lower layers. It looks like it's all perfection when it's all done and cleaned up, but they go through this same process. That's why Leonardo left us so many of his drawings and sketches, and he might just draw feet, you know, for a couple pages. But those feet would show up in some of his compositions later. The um, early American painters, like Thomas Moran, um, would go out into the woods and they wouldn't paint or draw a scene they would paint or draw rocks, or then they would have a couple pages of trees. And then when they were back in their studios, they would unify those elements and pick and choose the ones that they wanted to use in a particular composition. Now our plein air movement is more about capturing a picture while you're outside um, instead of getting really familiar with trees and rocks. I'm drawing fairly lightly, so it makes it difficult for you to see. Drawing is not my first medium, by the way. My first medium was um, contour drawing in watercolor or for watercolor. And that's where you look at your subject, whether it be a still life or whether it be a photograph. And you put your pencil down on the paper where you think you want to start like might be at the inner corner of an eye. And <clears throat> blonde contouring is where you draw from that point, looking at your picture, never lifting your pencil and never looking back at your paper. And you'll be surprised how accurate you can draw. And then there's modified contour where you never pick the pencil up, but you allow yourself to look at your paper. So it's whatever is comfortable. Well, which to me, none of it's comfortable when you're drawing blind. But you end up with um, uh, a very interesting 
drawing and then if you wish you can go back in and fine tune it or you can just paint on top of it and fine tune it as you go in watercolor that's an easy thing to do in oil if you draw a detailed drawing you're just going to cover the whole thing up anyway and yeah, none of it is going to show so most oil painters will do sketchy drawings like this before they start an oil painting on a separate canvas it's just personal preference if i told you that was the only way i'd be wrong And I use measurements all the way through, and I'm continually adjusting my my drawing points. Um, I may <clears throat> turn my pencil at an angle from the corner of the nose to the corner of the eye, measure that, and then I may do it on the other side. And then I might do a vertical line drop from the eye down to where the corner of the mouth is. And usually those are even. The corners of the mouth usually have the same measurement from the iris on each side. <clears throat> usually. In the perfect face, which I'm not sure any of us have. And it's all, it's all relative. So what I'm doing here is I'm practicing the things that I know. And by following something that an old master did, I can stretch my knowledge a little bit each time. And these are not for any purpose other than practice. Because developing your what you see out your hand is a hand-eye coordination that you have to have. And the only way you get it is by practice. It's like practicing scales when you're learning piano. You're not going to sit down and play those scales perfect all the way through the first time. No, it takes hours and hours of practice. In fact, every time you sit down at a piano, you warm up by doing those scales every time. And then you'll eventually get to the point where you can go through the whole scale um, all at once without any mistakes. Because your brain and your hand have memorized that, that motion. And that's the same thing you do in painting. So when you say you can't draw, I'm going to laugh at you. Well, I can't even draw a straight line with a ruler. And then I'll say, mm, I don't use a ruler. You know, so that's a moot point. If you want to learn how to draw, you can learn how to draw. It is a skill, not a talent. So find something that you want to get up in the morning and do. You, you want to carry a sketchbook with you and a pencil. You want to practice anytime you've got a few minutes. You just want to draw something. Draw, draw a face. Practice eyes. Just do eyes. And if it's not drawing or painting, then find another passion that you can do anytime, anywhere you are. I'm not real sure what else fits that. Um, definition other than drawing and the reason I'm hesitating is I'm trying to think you can't tie flies for trout fishing sitting in a car or a train station or an airport um, you can't do stained glass uh, you can knit and crochet or do handwork kind of cross stitch that's easy to travel with I've done that a lot so all of the handwork things as long as you're not trying to do a rug those those fit that um, formula I'm thinking mm, you can do mixed media in a journal if you have your kit um, narrowed down to just a handful of items like a couple of colored pencils a pencil a, a um, marker a black marker like a micron an eraser, a little pair of folding scissors or not, um, paint pen or two, those are great. Um, you don't necessarily want to travel with acrylic paint because that always raises some eyebrows when you go through inspections. But the other things are totally harmless and fit 
you can fit that and a notebook into a pouch not much bigger than a passport. So um, anyway, drawing and painting and mixed media art, you can do in the formula of, I can do it with five minutes anywhere I am. You know, back on the mixed media thing, um, you can take an Altoids box and put cutouts from magazines and and words from magazines, newspapers, whatnot. You could have little pieces of ribbon and things that you would use on a mixed media journal page in miniature. So that Altoid tin could carry a lot of smallish pieces and your journal is going to be small. So, <coughs> excuse me. You do need a glue stick. I forgot that. Some a way to put it down. Um, mm -hmm, thinking, thinking. Anything else that would fit your way of working, like maybe a roll of um, black and white washi tape for decoration, or see, I said colored pencils. What am I forgetting, guys? A water pen. I mean, a water brush with just water in it is awesome for that. Um, a little mini kit of watercolors, maybe with just six colors in it, like the pocket palette that I've shown you before. It comes in a neat little carry case. You can do that, or you can do the, um, like the Viviva, uh, paper with ink on them, where you just dampen your brush, go to the paper square, and then it paints, it picks it up. Those are ink, but they work great for this kind of thing. The first company that did it, I'm thinking, I don't remember the name of them. There was a company that started doing it in the late 1800s for colorizing photography. And they were the first, and then Viviva came out in the last couple of years, and they have some really pretty colors. Um, and their presentation might be a little bit easier to use. But that's real convenient to use with just a water brush and you can always find water and I have switched to a pen here in the drawing I think yes I have a pen working with a pen is permanent obviously and your strokes don't vary. They're all the same. So you can only get a different value in different areas by the lightness or hardness that you press. So if you get an area too dark and then find out that it really doesn't need to be that dark, you're screwed. Sorry, excuse me. Welcome to Wiki World. Um, so ink is not my favorite. I will always prefer pencil. Because if, you know, you can always just draw a big X through it and turn the page, start over. Believe me, that's legal. And the typical way to work is from light to dark. So you don't commit yourself to the darks until you sure that eye's in the right place. Otherwise, that dark is never going to go away and you're really in start over country. Oh, you could always put a lock of hair down over the bad eye. That would work. There is, I've said this a million times, I'll say it again. There are two categories of drawing, in my humble opinion. And one is to draw for the end result of a drawing, and that's for, like, charcoal or pencil you know, drawing, 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 like I'm doing here. <clears throat> and then there's drawing for painting, which is what I touched on earlier, where with, if, if I were doing this in oil, or maybe even pastel, that's questionable, but definitely oil, I would just paint the eye socket in a medium value, so like a value five, uh, halfway between white and black. I would just paint the area where the eye socket is. And then I would follow the shadow under the eye socket as it curves around the cheek and go and continue in that manner your uh, medium tone and try to pick out just the darks and lights. Just have two shades, dark and light. 
Okay, I think I said that, dark and light. So you'll have those two shapes where you're painting shadows or the mid-tone color or tone and the lighter colors on the face in the sunlight are just white. When you get that quote perfected unquote, then you're ready to go back in and split the shaded, shadowed, <laughs> the shadowed side or the shadowed shape into two values. So you add a dark, not black, but a darker dark so that you can definitely tell which shadow portion is toward the light and which is toward the dark. And then on the light side, you do the same and you put a little bit darker value than white on pieces of that face where it turns back or where maybe the eye socket curves. And you have got four values now on a face that will, will do you well to practice that method. There's, there are books written about, that's, that's a wiki version of Notan. N-O-T-A-N is a Japanese word, and it basically boils down to black and white. So basically that's what I just told you to do, except use 50% halfway to black, so that it gives you the opportunity to go darker. But no tan is what a lot of artists do when they're painting in plain air, is they plan their composition with the two tones, black and white. <clears throat> and to carry that a little bit further, you modify what you see by connecting the dark and light shapes. So you would not have a dark shape here on the side of the face and then jump up to the top of it and have more dark. You try to combine those so that you've got one shape that's connected. And the same with the light area. And then the next thing that you do is try to figure out which which tone has the most, covers the most. So if you've got 70% black and 30% white, that's a good proportion. You don't want 50-50. You want one to dominate. Now, it's a whole lot easier for me to say these things than it is for me to do these things. But awareness is half of the battle. I draw a lot from electronics. Ten years ago, it wasn't as prevalent, A, because internet connections weren't that good, and B, um, the power of the electronic world wasn't quite there. Nor portability. There were no iPads and iPhones. And I began doing, using my computer for resource when I was in my studio and that required having a monitor or a big TV monitor within eyesight of my painting and so then now that phones and iPads are there you're in good shape you can just do that anywhere you want to make full use of the filters on your phone or iPad because photographs typically black out the shadows they don't show you definition in the shadows. <clears throat> so by adjusting hue and saturation or darkness and lightness, whatever your filters have, you can lighten the, lighten the image enough so that the shadow shows some detail. So when you finish with your uh, shaded value, you go to you go back to your original. And then as you prepare to do the lightest shot side, your white area, you make it a little bit darker because the light 
or the camera eye sometimes blows out the light colors. So again, you want to see some definition, you want to see some value change on the light side of that face to make it read as a three-dimensional object. That's a little trick I learned from a fabulous portrait artist. Her name was Ann Polk. All my mentors are leaving me. <laughs> I guess that means I'm getting old too, but we're not going to talk about that, are we? If you can get in the habit of keeping a pencil and a notebook with you at all times, you'll be surprised how fast your skills will grow. Vicki, pay attention. And for the past year or two since the Apple Pencil came out, I've been trying to capture a love for Procreate drawing on the iPad. And there are people who do fabulous artwork on digital. Um, I say trying to because it's a little bit counterintuitive to actually holding, I mean, you're holding a pencil, but <clears throat> um, I can't really describe it. The risk is not the same because you can put you can put everything on a different layer. Like you can put the dark shape on a layer and the white shape on a layer, and then you can add a layer for the midtone and just keep doing it that way. And if you don't like what you've got, you can go back into that layer that you did in the beginning and erase part of it and draw it back in. So you can't really do that with real drawing. But um, that's a real good use for what are we looking at there? Oh, I'm sorry. That's my voiceover. <laughs> there. It was sitting right in front of the, the drawing. If you want to use some of these drawings from Old Masters, do a search for uh, Da Vinci Drawing or um, just the name of who you want to do because they all did sketching and drawing before they did their paintings. That's how they got familiar. They didn't have cameras to speak of. Uh, so they had to practice those parts and pieces anywhere they could from humans. Um, so sketches, um, monoprints, a lot of Degas used monoprinting as the basis for his famous pastels of the ballet dancers. He drew onto a plate and then printed in black ink on printing paper uh, the silhouette of his dancers, and then he would mount that onto his easel and do his pastel on top, and that's how he did his drawing. So you can learn a lot by looking at the Degas drawings or prints. I want to invite you guys to join my field notes concept. I will come up with a different name for it so you know what I'm talking about. It is based around an 1850s journal, a field note journal by a naturalist around the 1850s, and includes every stop along the way, and the end destination was the Amazon River, or the rainforest. But there were big cities involved, and travels by train, and, and there were... Um, all kinds of opportunities to investigate the flora and fauna of the trip to get there and back. So um, that's going to be fun. It's going to involve uh, some manuscript reading from the journal and a painting by me on one day. And then the next day I will use some of the printables from the journal to do a field note journal of my own. So any kind of a journal will work. Um, I have a craft text journal cover and I'm just going to do a uh, Fibonacci style with elastic bands 
for the journal body and then as I finish a group of pages or a month or a week or however many it uh, turns out to be I can take those out put new ones in and I'm ready to go with another segment of my journal and then take those pages that are out and bind them into either a leather cover or a book binding cover so that is a project that um, you can get into it from any any point but you'll want to start at the beginning just because there is a story involved so that will start around January 15th And again, please join me on my Facebook page, Vicki Ross Art. And the Facebook group is Actually Art. And the Patreon group will be up soon with all kinds of secret goodies to add to your field notes book for just a couple of dollars a month. And the printables that I do will be available to the first few people for free on my Teachable site. And then after that, after those have been claimed, it will go up to probably $6, a nominal amount. Or you can join Patreon and get them free every month. Plus, plus, plus. Looking at this on film, <clears throat> and I may catch it later, I don't know. Her mouth is too short on our right hand side see how it doesn't come out to the underneath the iris it looks like it's ending just past the nose so you can see things like that when you're looking at it from this angle instead of where you're drawing it and it could be that her mouth is trying to flatten we have a tendency to see a head in turn like in a turn shape like this and we got the, you got the thing about the, the iris to iris to the nose center being perpendicular to each other. You got that. But a natural tendency as you come down the page, your nose is parallel to the line on your eyes and the mouth is parallel to the nose. So all three of those features are parallel to each other. Your nose may be pretty good, pretty close. It might tilt down to the right a little. And then when you get to the mouth, it may tilt down just a little. And before you know it, you have forced it into a symmetrical face forward drawing. So that's always funny. And it could be that I've done that here. Um, actually, I think it's pretty fair to say that my eyes are on a different slant than my nose and mouth but that's a common thing your eye tries to make everything square to the world and again once you know that is true you can be on the lookout for it and I have people say oh you're too critical of your own work no that's not being critical that's teaching my eye to see what I to draw what I really see not what my mind thinks it sees critiquing your own work involves I can't do this I'll never learn this 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 is awful but a real critique of your own work is hmm maybe I should measure those eyes and that mouth get a straight edge and very carefully draw it down and see if the nose is perfectly parallel and then drop it down see if the mouth is and that is valuable criticism for yourself turn it upside down look at it that way that's another way to see those things that are out of drawing I love that phrase it's out of drawing I had a tutor one time that would say that to me all the time that's out of drawing what what he was meaning was it proportionally was off something was off and just didn't look right so it's out of drawing that was 
oil painting that we were doing that, but it's usable anywhere. And I have a horrible habit of getting in a hurry when I get to this stage. And then I go, okay, that's enough. Usually it takes me about an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm getting in a hurry and not using the same care that I did earlier. But again, that's also a reason to start with the thing that matters most do it first. Please make that mouth a little wider. Now sometimes you'll think that your your nose is the culprit and that it's not right when it's actually the space between the eyes. Or you may think an eye is cocked and tilted by itself away from you know, so that it's not perfectly straight line from eye to eye. And you adjust that one eye when it wasn't that eye at all. It may have been the nose. And as dark as I'm getting the eyes right here, I need to match that darkness somewhere else in the drawing. Now see, I'm measuring again. What do I do? What do I do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm probably quitting. That's probably what I'm going to do. So, mm, I'm bored. Bye. And keep in mind, too, that you, you're usually looking at, you know, people in working class environments. And definitely back in Leonardo's time, they were really rough looking characters. So, you're not looking at classic beauty in a lot of these situations maybe come on come on come on draw that mouth out a little ah, there we go there we go all right guys i hope you enjoyed this and i hope my ramblings gave you a clue or two and that's it i will see you next week